dogs and they're playing poker. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and on today's show, a huge headline. Industry heavyweight Vanguard is ushering in a new CEO, and his pedigree isn't just low-cost index funds. What does that mean for your... Heck, what does it mean for our money? We'll share. Plus, we'll answer a question from one stacker who thought, you know what, I'd better call Saul. See hi and OG about a hot banking topic called velocity banking. Is this too good to be true? And you already know, stacker, that I'd never, ever let a show end without sharing some of my incredible trivia. And now, two guys who are about to bring the noise. Okay. <laughs> it's Joe and O J J J J G. Yes, we are. Yes, we with are. A Z. Always with a Z. It is with a, even in the script. It's with a Z. Oh, hey everybody, we are fired up and ready to go. It is Wednesday, and you are here. We're so happy you're with us. Welcome to the Stacking Benjamin Show the greatest money show on earth and the circus OG is about to begin because we've got some great stuff. New CEO at Vanguard, new CEO. Heard that. Is the world going to change? No. Things going to be different? No. No? You're predicting that. I don't know. I don't know. Wait till you know who the guy is? Nope. Nope. We're going to dive into that. I love that. I'm going to have, uh, what's that, plausible deniability? Is that what it's called? No, I mean, I, I know that they have a new CEO, and I, I just yes. don't remember his name. Mr. Blackrock. That's what you uh, can call him. Maybe. Mr. Blackrock. Good stuff there. And I know you're a big fan of Velocity Banking, so mm. I can't wait to hear your take on that. Super big fan. Yes. Anytime we can combine insurance with our investments, I think you're all about that. So here's what I want everybody to do. Grab a sheet of paper or your favorite note-taking device. Because you're going to want to take notes on everything we talk about today, starting off with the headline, making our way through the TikTok minute. Mm, it's good, but we make this show free for you, and I'm super happy we can do that. We've got some great sponsors that uh, help us do that. Here are a couple of them now. Vanguard in the headline, so let's go. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Today's headline comes to us from Morningstar. Morningstar's take on Vanguard's new CEO. Get this. You ready? I, th I think some of our Vanguard hardliners are going to want to sit down for a second. They might want to breathe. Just sit down, breathe in, breathe out. Because I think, oh, gee, some people might start hyperventilating. Morningstar's take on Vanguard's new CEO I can't even say it. Fee increases and more <laughs> happening over at Vanguard. Daniel Sadaroff and Susan Zabinski talked about this one. This is just an interview back and forth between Susan and Daniel. The interesting piece of this, and I'll link to it in the show notes. Zabinski says, the big news, Vanguard named a successor to CEO Tim Buckley, who stepped down this month. And the new CEO is a former executive from a competitor, BlackRock. So the first thing that they asked uh, Sutteroff is, was he surprised that they brought in somebody from outside the firm? And Sutteroff said, yes, surprise is probably an understatement. Everything about it was surprising. First, we didn't expect Buckley to retire. Second, usually when Vanguard announces these things, at least in the past, they've always mentioned who's going to come in and take over. So you had that assurance there was going to be some continuity but they left it open. They didn't name a successor right away. And then bam, when they left the successorship open, turned out that it is this person from Celine Ramji. And then out of the blue, apparently, according to Morningstar OG, they appoint Salim Ramji from uh, BlackRock. And that started at the beginning of this month. I think this news is going to freak out some Vanguard-ers, right? Because 
new CEO from a company like BlackRock, like BlackRock definitely has a point of view the way they see the universe. And if somebody spent their career at a different firm, they're going to bring a little bit of a different flavor to Vanguard. So I think that's probably the first thing we should expect, don't you? I don't understand why it would be a bad thing. There's a lot of research around groupthink and certainly the number two person or the number three person or the number, you know, the top five people at Vanguard who are kind of sitting there pressing their palms together going, all right, this is my time. I bet they're feeling pretty disappointed. But this happens a lot in corporate America, right? Where there's like, you know, an outsider gets a, has a different perspective or a different quote unquote upbringing. And that provides a fresh way to look at things. I know one of the things I was talking to somebody the other day, we were talking about the idea of products and how, you know, years ago, Joe, when you and I started, if you wanted money at Franklin, you had to have an account at Franklin. If you wanted a Vanguard product, you had to have an account at Vanguard. You know, we dealt with early on these investors who had multiple accounts and multiple massive you know, statements custodians. all over yeah, the place. Just, I mean, but that was how it was. If you wanted this fund, you had to have an account there. And then brokerage accounts became more popular and could handle stuff other than stock. That was mainly the the account that you would have if you had stock trading. But then all of a sudden you could add mutual funds to it. And then of course now brokerage accounts have everything. So it became an opportunity to consolidate and make things easier for clients in terms of custodian relationships. So now if you want a Vanguard product, you don't have to go to Vanguard to get it. You can own it inside of your Fidelity account. You can own it inside of your Schwab account or whatever, right? But there's still some circumstances, retirement plans, for example, and some other things where you have to go directly to that place. And I was talking about Vanguard in particular with this person, and we were talking about the user interface at Vanguard and how it's like circa 1974, I don't know, 78 maybe. It's not great <laughs> compared to the other like up-to-date oh. custodial place platforms, right? Oh, gee, so many pieces I read researching this to get ready for this discussion today went back to the interface and the fact yeah. that on, on his listening campaign, that's the first thing hopefully that uh, this new CEO is going to hear over and over and over that the end user experience, just not good. Well, and that, and that brings up the question. It's like, you got to have the money to invest into that stuff. You need to hire developers and you have to spend money on the technology and spend money on the, on the maintenance of it and the creation of it. And where's it going to come from? Has it been reported that they expect fee increases or that's just what everybody's thinking? But otherwise, where's it, where would it come from? If you want a better experience, it's got to come from somewhere, right? Yeah. The firm recently got flack for raising some fees on some of its brokerage services. So a few of those, they are two categories. The big one is a $25 fee that's going to be charged to anyone uh. trying to trade a Vanguard ETF or mutual fund over the phone. If you're going to call it in, you're going to get charged 25 bucks. They are forcing <laughs> you to use the internet. They're forcing you to use their crappy interface. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's applied, by the way, only to smaller accounts. So if you have less than a million smaller accounts, it's how Vanguard yeah. defines a smaller account. And actually, you know, these people at Morningstar even say the same thing. They're trying to discourage people from using the phone for routine stuff. Just if it's routine, go to our crappy interface and let's do it. And then the second one is kind of this odd lots bucket, they call it. A $100 fee if you close or transfer an account that's less than 5 million bucks. So Vanguard's going to slap Whoa. you on the butt on the less way than out. 5 million. Yeah. $100 fee. But OG, oh, when you close an account almost anywhere, you see they slap you with a fee on the way out, don't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a little love tap on the rear end as you, you go out the yes. door. Yep. Don't come back, right? <laughs> We're going to make sure that you hate us on the way out. A $250 fee for moving restrictions on a security. Okay. A $100 fee for depositing physical share certificates. Another reason you don't want to have physical share certificates. In fact, these guys even say there were physical shares at one point in time. We forget that. So not a lot of fees that are going to hit the average person on an average day, but Vanguard's not known for this. And people are already giving them flack. Oh, gee, oh, look, we got a new CEO coming in from BlackRock, which is not the low cost provider that you see Vanguard's been. And look at what's happening already. Irma Gerd. Yeah. I just come back to, it's a little bit of, you can't have your cake and eat it too type of thing. You know, you got to. Yeah. You got to have a little bit. And and frankly, a lot of those things are the nuisance things for the firm. If you're calling when, when 90, I bet you have 98% of their transactions are electronic. 
but they still have to staff a call center for the 2% of people that call. And so that 24 hour staffing center or that 18 hour staffing that, you know, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of money. It's like, all right, we got to pay for them somehow. We're going to pay for it. If you want to use them, you have to pay for it. Same thing with, you know, the brokered services and the trade clearing and stuff like that. It's like, if you're going to send us a stock certificate and we have to freaking manage that somehow, go through all the process and hoops to verify that this is legit, you're going to pay us hundred bucks for it. So I understand that. I don't expect to see a ton of change with the change at CEO. Certainly whenever, I mean, even when you don't change CEO, I think the thing that we, we all freak out whenever there's any change and the only thing that's constant is change. So I kind of feel like freaking out over change. Put that is, on a t-shirt. Nobody's ever said that before. I know, right? It's a, it's this losing battle. You're going to be a salmon swimming upstream, but oh he was the guy that the last five years was the global head of iShares and their indexing. So what Vanguard did was brought in their biggest competitors guy who ran the thing that they're trying to keep people away from. Right. I mean, Vanguard's biggest competitor is definitely iShares. So bringing mm -hmm. in their top guy before that, uh, working with index tracking funds, he spent 16 years as, at McKinsey as a consultant. So he was on that, asset management, wealth management industry when he worked at McKinsey as a consultant. So this guy knows a ton of what's going on and who knows, but I think, I think the takeaway here, OG for any Vanguard user is it's going to be change. There will be change. The reality is, is that that stuff happens all the time anyway. It's not really public. And well, I mean, it's public, but it's not a lot of press around, you know, when there's funds that consolidate or programs that they shut down or, you know what I mean? Like, all of business is just hopefully constant innovation. Schwab just announced a couple of weeks ago, one of the platforms that we use a lot, they just said, yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. And it's like, it's oh, done. crap. Yeah. You know, they're giving us two years to deal with it, but it's, hey, we did it. We want to force you to use this new thing. And the way that we force you to use this new thing is we get rid of that old thing and tell you we're not going to let you use it anymore. There's always going to be stuff like that and products that change and, that sort of thing. The, the important thing I think is the big stuff that is in your area of opportunity to control. You know, Vanguard changes their fees from 0 0.04 to 0.07. That's not going to destroy your retirement. You won't even notice it, honestly. It's such an insignificant dollar amount that it's that, that it won't even happen. But if you change your behavior because of it, if you go, well, I'll show those SOBs, I won't max out my Roth this year. Like... <laughs> Trust me, they're not going to notice it either. You know well, what I mean? you and I are laughing about this, and it truly isn't funny because you know why we're laughing about it? Because we hear it all the time. I've heard that before. Yeah. I'll show them. Uh, I can't stay my employer, so I'm not putting money in that 401k of I'll theirs. I'll show them. Yes. I don't want that. What the hell are you going to do with it if you don't put it in the 401k? What are you going to do with that money? Yeah. So you do you. I think that is a great takeaway. There have been so many changes over the years. And every time we get people freaking out about them, and definitely with the number of people that use Vanguard that are in our community, I'm sure that we're probably seeing some, and in, in, there's people listening to us right now going, I don't know, uh, I don't like this. New fees, uh, outsider who isn't Jack Bogle, who's all of a sudden who's not turning the ship a different way. We have risen him from the grave. Yeah. It is pretty well. This piece, by the way, goes into their actively managed funds as well at Vanguard, a product people forget that Vanguard has, and mm -hmm. about how Vanguard is losing assets in those products. They're, they're losing tons of money in those products. But, oh, gee, that's a trend, not just with Vanguard. That's a trend with the entire industry. Yeah. Oh, big time. Yeah. Vanguard dividend growth lost about $7 billion during the last couple of years. Wellington Fund, one of their flagship funds, that lost $15 billion. Wellesley lost $14 billion. Prime Cap, the one original one from 1984, lost about $9 billion over the last three years. And not lost in terms of the market went down and they lost it. No. Lost in terms of people took their money out and moved it to some other product, whether internal or external. $160 billion has flowed out of Vanguard's actively managed product mix. And you know what, OG? I mean, to some degree, let's talk about the active mix anyway, even though we're generally not on that train. Even if we were, Vanguard's actively managed portfolio, not that stellar. Like, definitely you could do worse 
than having actively managed Vanguard funds, but they're not the leaders by any stretch of the imagination when it comes to actively managed accounts. Well, the thing with active management, everybody uses the wrong terminology here is that they'll say things like, you know, you can't beat the market, you know, active management doesn't work. And the the reality is that it does in some instances. The problem is that you can't pick that instance in advance. And so what we've grown accustomed to doing and saying, I wouldn't say accustomed to doing yet, although I think the tide is turning there, is that we've recognized that it's easier to just have one of everything than try to figure out is Ford going to beat GM or is Apple going to beat Google, you know, and try to stock select our way to performance. That doesn't mean that active managers don't outperform from time to time. It happens. It happens roughly 40% of the time. So it's doable, but it's not able to be predicted in advance and it costs extra money. So this is true for every active product, not just Vanguard's. You can look at any company, Fidelity or BlackRock or American Funds or you know any of those places that have a fund manager who's in charge of stock selection, who's you know using some sort of analysis to decide whether they're going to buy or sell this particular security. And you know what? There's a lot of times they're right. And there's a lot of times they're not right. And they could be right a whole bunch in a row. And that doesn't mean that they'll be right the next time. And that's really, as we think about client portfolios and we think about you know investment behavior, if I can't use research and science to kind of have an idea of how this is going to play out, then to me, it's just, it's more of a crapshoot. You know, it's more of a gamble. And anytime you hear investors or investment people say, well, our economists believe, or our fund manager thinks, you're basically just interjecting someone's opinion into your investment program. And that doesn't mean their opinion's incorrect or correct. It's just, how do I deal with that? In my own personal investment philosophy or my own personal investment plan, I can't deal with that because it's your opinion. And maybe your opinion is correct or maybe it's incorrect, but I'm not going to pay you for that right now. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, it's just easier for us. And we know statistically how this works. It's just easier if I just get the market returns. And there's some areas of higher expected return that you can add some flavor to your portfolio by having small companies or companies that have been around a while and higher profitability companies. We know that through the academic research that those produce higher expected returns. And so we're going to tilt that way. But nowhere does it say in the academic research that the active manager at Vanguard is going to produce a better result. Or Peter Lynch, who is a really great investor, is going to produce a better result. He did, which is awesome. If you were part of that, he did produce a better result but I can't prove to you that he would do it again. So I'll take the known outcome, which is I'll just get market returns plus a little flavor. That works for me. It makes your ride a little smoother. Well, here's a question though, because you've said there have been some people, OG, that have beaten the market over periods of time. One group that I'm thinking of is Renaissance Capital, who beat Warren Buffett, beat the pants off the market, doesn't take any outside money. If you're not a member of that firm, you're not investing with Renaissance Capital. But their returns have been phenomenal. And it does use the science that you're talking about. They don't use people's opinion. Often, Mm -hmm. they don't have any idea whether the companies they're investing in are profitable or not. It is just science based on a bunch of factors that, frankly, we don't know. We know they're quantitative. Vanguard, one of their top funds, according to this piece, because they go into some of Vanguard's worst performers, which is just mutual funds in general, having lots of assets go out of them. Again, not market-wise, bad performer, but assets flowing out. A place that is hot right now, not just with assets flowing in, but also market-wise, is the Vanguard US Momentum Factor ETF, VFMO, outperformed its category index by 5%. It's smaller, uh, this man uh, Sadarov says, and it's that one of the strategic beta funds, it's managed by Vanguard's quant equity group, and it follows a set of rules. So there's not somebody deciding Mm -hmm. whether it's good or bad. It is a momentum strategy that's based on science. Where do you put a fund like this? Is this the type of fund that may have an edge that we should get into? Or are are we playing with fire if we start getting into these quant funds that we really don't understand? I think that for anything to be successful or at least used for a platform moving forward, I would want to know 
that that area or that specialization has worked over multiple market cycles and also agnostic of market itself. So if you said, for example, this momentum fund, we'll use this as an example, has been really great since 2013. We've based on this, you know, we've had great results in the U.S. tech market. It's awesome. Now take that and let's apply that to international or, or emerging markets. I'll be like, well, I don't know. 2013 till present is not a market cycle, right? That's barely a decade. U.S. tech stocks is hardly all the market. It's hardly ambivalent of the different sectors. So to me, that doesn't sound like a factor that I want to put a lot of energy into. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just like, there's not enough behind that yet. Whereas like if I take something like high profitability, if you segregate companies from high profitability into low profitability, and then look at their investment results, this is not shocking, by the way. <laughs> it's just like, you know, and these areas of higher expected return kind of beat you over the head. The easiest one is stocks do better than bonds, right? Like that's, you know, you're like, dude, what, duh. Well, you're hey, not about to know. tell me though. You're not about to tell me that more profitable companies actually perform better in the stock market than low <laughs> profit companies. Yes, as a matter of fact. Yes, Shut they up. do. It's weird. But in order for me to believe that, in order for me to use that as part of my investment philosophy, it needs to be shown over long periods, you know, 1950 to present, right? Recorded history of market, you know, has this but always don't you been think the, the case? Vanguard's group is going to use some long term numbers? Like they're not just going to go, hey, Lou, let's look at what happened last week and let's build a quant fund around that. I'm not saying they do or don't. I'm saying what are the criteria that I would want to know before I would count this as part of something that is is worthwhile putting into your portfolio. So the high profitability, for example, works in all market conditions, right? Makes sense, it would. Companies that are highly profitable, even when things don't go well, tend to fare better. That makes sense. That works in all market sectors. It works in the US and non-US. It's everywhere. It's pervasive. So you can take that and apply that to any sort of part of your investment portfolio. And I can say high profitability emerging market companies do better than low profitability. High profitability US tech companies do better than low profitability. High profitability international large stocks do better than low. And they do better in different market periods over different time periods. So to me, I go, okay, that makes sense. Somebody's researched that. Basically, this is all an offshoot of the three-factor model from the 70s, 80s, and 90s that became famous with Eugene Fema and Ken French. And basically, it was small companies, stocks, and value companies have this edge. And profitability is the other area of this now. And momentum is another one that I know there's a lot of research going into. So it doesn't surprise me that Vanguard has a momentum fund. It's definitely a buzzword. But I haven't seen the, the academic research yet to suggest that this is true in all market conditions. And if it is, then it's another area, I think, that you can add a little bit of flavor to your portfolio. No different than high profitability would be. You know, you just go, well, it makes sense, right? Like if I have all the stocks in the universe, and this is the difference between index investing and index investing and asset class investing, or adding a little bit of this thought around it. We're not saying that Ford's going to do better than GM. I'm saying... Ford is more profitable than GM. I don't know if it is or not. I'm just making that up. But you know what I mean? Therefore, that's why it's in the portfolio and GM's not. Not because I think that the CEO at this company is going to do better. You know, like I'm using these factors to decide. And I know that gives us a higher expected return, a, a better likelihood of success by including these areas. So if I got all the stocks in the S&P 500 and there's 500 of them and I take out the 200 that aren't profitable, Am I expected to have a better return? I don't know if the number's 200, but I'm, you know what I mean? It makes sense to say, well, I can still be an index investor and passive really is what you're talking about here. You just want to be a passive investor and apply these academic epiphanies, I guess, to your investing. And so Vanguard does that. And a lot of companies do that. iShares do it. Sure. Yeah, Fidelity does. Yeah. Dimensional does it. Avantis, American Century. You know, there's a lot of work going in here because people are finally realizing that the money isn't in Peter Lynch. <laughs> you know, name the fund manager of VTI. <laughs> big, big fund, right? Everybody knows v VOO. Huge. Uh, who's the fund manager? Doesn't matter. Nobody knows, 
right? But 20 years ago, if Peter Lynch left Magellan, everybody knew. Huge news. Huge news. Way, way, way bigger news than this uh, CEO change. If somebody else went from, oh my gosh, he was the fund manager at such and such a company. Now he's the fund manager at this company. People would move their money to that just because of the person running the money. Immediately. Or move their money out because so and so Or move their money out because somebody else is out, right? Yeah. But nowadays, you know, you don't know that. So where do we want to put the energy? Is it in the people? Is it in the like great ideas that the fund manager has? Well, we've proven that that's not predictable. It's not going to give us an edge. So what will? Well, academic research will. Energy and effort into taking the decision-making out of it, right? Yeah. I think what gives the average investor an edge right now, the easiest edge is what Darius Faroo said on our show a couple of weeks ago. Stop doing stupid crap because you're going to beat <laughs> 95% of investors just by staying indexed, not touching it, and letting it flow, like get into the right fund, run it till you need the money. And you know what? You're going to be 98% of the people. Do you because... know who Alex Harmozy is? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. can't watch that guy's videos, by the way. For people who don't know who this guy is. He looks like a the Unabomber or something. He worked with lots of gyms. And so he's a guy who teaches gyms how to be more profitable. But he has now catapulted that into becoming a marketing expert for lots yeah. of different people. But I still, OG, oh I can't watch his videos because that dude's so jacked. I can't even listen to what he's saying because I'm like, God, those guns, just those freaking yeah, guns. Turned on too quickly. I understand. Yeah. That's why I, it's just neck up here on the show because I don't, yeah, want, you don't to be, want to do that to people. Can't show you the cannons. <laughs> you get all quiver inside. Yeah. I was listening to something that he was saying a little bit ago and it kind of dovetails into what you're talking about here. He didn't say it's don't do dumb stuff. He was basically like, most people don't do anything. And so by, and he was talking about it in the context of like sales and marketing. And he's like, most people don't do anything. So by doing something, you're like way ahead. And God forbid you actually work four hours a day, like on the thing that you're supposed to be really good at. You know, the average person works four hours a week. Try to make that four hours a day. It's like, well, no, I work 12, you know, I work 40 hours. No, you don't, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, most people don't work in their area of expertise all the time. There's coffee breaks and lunch breaks. You're spending a lot of time know. in meetings, pushing papers. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff, right? And so his thing is, is like, if you can get two hours of actual work done in the morning before- On that unique thing that you're th good that at. That thing, you know, you're going to be so far ahead of everyone else in the entire universe by just like literally that little bit. That works for- gyms it works for you know you're investing if you just do the not dumb stuff you know like don't day trade you know just max out your 401k you're gonna be light years ahead. all right stackers here is your takeaway this is what i'd like you to do with that note taking that you've been doing here's the question what have you done to make sure that you're not doing the dumb stuff. I'd love to hear those, by the way. You can call those into us, stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail. Uh, send in what, what you have done. What did you change that will make sure that you're not doing that dumb stuff? Or what is the thing that you're pledging that you are going to change? Like everybody knows the thing. Like we all have the thing that we're doing that we need to do better at. What is that thing? How are we going to make sure that we take advantage of our edge? And maybe it is that you trade your stuff too much. Maybe it is that you see things like the change in a CEO and you go make a big change with your money or you worry too much that Vanguard's going to increase their fees by whatever the amount is. What is the change? Stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail. And uh, love to hear what you've got. And we can play some of these uh, success stories and kind of challenge people a little bit here, OG. Coming up next, it is our TikTok Minute. Who is the brilliant TikTok creator that's hopefully going to mentor you on this wild Wednesday? Oh, we got a good one, OG. We got a good one. But is it good or air quotes good? We're going to have that in just a minute. But first, before we get to our remaining sponsor spots for the day, so the rest of today's episode is completely ad-free, uh, Doug, you've got today's trivia question. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And you know what's gross? Avocados. Can you believe it? Joe's mom actually eats these things? Why are avocados horrible? Oh, I'll tell you, made-up person I created for this rant. First, they're green. 
I don't need anything green unless it's like a Jolly Rancher. B, it's squishy and moist. Nope, not saying that word, the, uh, you know, the M word. Two words that never make me think, let's get that near my mouth. And third, I just don't like them. I mean, does there always have to be three things? I don't, I don't think so. I don't agree with that construct. So let's just get to it. We all know that Mexico is the world's largest exporter of avocados and that the USA is the biggest importer. But today's trivia question is, who's the second biggest exporter of avocados in the world? This is a question that needs to be answered. I'll be back right after I go think about throwing up. That's way more fun than thinking about avocados. Hey there, Stacker. I'm avocado denier and guy who's never getting green stuff on anything, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. During the break, Joe's mom shared with me that avocados do have at least one redeeming quality, apparently. They're used a little, a little bit, uh, in guacamole. Well, I, I kind of like guac, but from now on, I think I'm gonna get it without avocado. I mean, it's just disgusting. There's gotta be another option. Here was today's trivia question. What nation is the world's second biggest importer of this gross vegetable, fruit? Does anybody know? Really, does anybody care? Well, here's what you do care about. It's Mexico stacking up all the avocado money, but in second place is Peru. Per, per, I don't know if you roll the R there. Peru, a country that shipped over 36,000 tons of this grossness in January and February of this year alone. It's gotta be fun making tons of money on other people's disgusting habits. Oh, that gives me an idea. Hey, and now back to Joe and OG. You looked at Doug like those are fighting words, OG. Yeah, for sure. Cheryl loves avocados. We eat them at least three a week or four a week, I bet. I'm with Doug, unless it's in guacamole. I'm not going near that. No, thank you. Like, not on a salad? Really? Green and slimy? Yummy. Yeah. Not- you know, you can just take it and smush it up and then call it guacamole. Did I tell you I'm going to be going to Peru? Did I tell you that? Oh, boy. Isn't that great? Next. And scene. You don't want to know about my trip to Peru? I do, but could you email it to me? Have you ever been to South America? Uh, No. No, me neither. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. Hey, time for our TikTok minute. Time when we shine the light on a TikTok creator who's either creating something brilliant or air quotes brilliant. So, OG, we've got, man, this is good. But is it good or is it air quotes good? Which one do you think we got going on here? It's, it's not good. It's on the internet. So I'm going no, nothing. No bueno. Deborah, stacker Deborah sent this to me. I think what this dude says here probably makes a lot of sense. This is a uh, Gen Z crypto guru. About to buy a million dollar home for half the price. The thing is, you can only do this if you know how to utilize cryptocurrency. So this is the house that I'm going to buy, and it costs about 1.4 million. So I'll have to pay around seven grand a month. But for this entire house, the total that I need to pay is 740K. And it's because of crypto. For the down payment, I'll have to pay about 20%, which is 290K. With the remaining 450K, I'm going to put that into the Anchor Protocol. Once I deposit the 450K, it'll yield me 19% per year. That's 88 grand a year. <laughs> Now divide that by 12 months, and that's going to make me 7.3K a month, just enough to cover the monthly cost of this mansion. After it's paid off, I'll have a $1.4 million home, plus be making 7.3K a month doing nothing. If you want to learn more about crypto, check out my bio. Uh, that guy sounds really, I, I can get, what, 19% a month? Why is the first search on Google, Anchor Protocol Collapse? <laughs> I don't even know what that is. But I get 19.55%. What a great return. And all I got to do is come up with the 500 and some thousand dollars for the, you know, that piece of the down payment, put it in crypto. That's all you do. See if you've got 740,000 bucks, it just makes total sense to me. This is obviously a lot uh, something from a long time ago. Cause I just, I'm, I'm just Googling this cause I didn't really hear this it. This was June 22nd of 2024. Well, in May of 2022, there was a big article about how it went down like a hundred percent or something. I don't know. <laughs> Well, apparently it's back. Oh, boy. Yeah, I mean, look. Go for it. Do it. What is that thing Mama always says? Do it and email me and let me know what and, goes. and her money or... YOLO? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Not the fool and her money thing. The YOLO thing is what we look yeah. at. 
Thanks, Deborah, for sending that to me. Uh, obviously, it, it, if somebody's telling you 19.55%, there's a catch. You can't get that. There's a catch. There is maybe a slight amount of volatility that, that could come with that type of a position. I love when young Gen Z is teaching us the new, new way to get a bunch of money. $1.4 million house. That's what he's doing. He's just buying a $1.4 million. Who doesn't want a $1.4 million house? Of course we do. I want do. to know the bank that's going to let her let him borrow the money based on this strategy. I'm just, <laughs> just going to throw it in crypto. Because I also want to go to that bank <laughs> to borrow some money. Before they run out, go out of business. How are you going to pay for this, son? Uh, well, here's my strategy. I'm going to take half a million dollars. I'm going to put it in the anchor protocol. And it's gone. <laughs> and scene. I thought that uh, we were done with crypto bro TikTok. So I'm glad Deborah was able to find one for us because it yeah. feels like old times, doesn't it? Like a warm blanket to just have another crypto bro telling me all the good stuff that I could do if Coulda, I should have, would have just, just had known. just would have. I mean, look, if I would have put a hundred grand in Bitcoin in 2012, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Yeah. And also not touched it for the entirety of that period of time, but I didn't. So I'm here today with you. Unfortunately for you. No, no. Fortunately. It's great. You're, you're stuck. I'm, I'm not worth the $17 billion. So that's, that's great for everyone, especially me. I had Cheryl tell me one time, did I tell you this? I had Cheryl tell me one time because, you know, my brother-in-law did that and she's like, why didn't we do it? And I said, just because it worked out really well does not mean it's sound. It doesn't mean it was sound decision-making like yeah. it's a bet and it pays, which is what happens when you bet, right? Yeah. Just because you go to the casino and you win a thousand bucks at the casino or 5,000 bucks at the casino doesn't mean that a sound strategy is playing roulette. I was listening to, uh, I don't know how this happened on YouTube, but it came up. There's this guy on YouTube. I'm sure you've seen him. Apparently he's really good at casino games. Dude's all tatted up. He's doing the YouTube podcast tour of how casinos are screwing you out of money and whatever. Apparently, he was really good at casino. Anyways, he was talking about roulette. And the guy was like, well, you yeah, know, that's completely random. He goes, it's not random. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, it's just the thing spinning the ball. You know, it's like completely random. He goes, okay. He goes, let me ask you this. What does Steph Curry do every day, five hours a day, his entire life? He goes, he shoots baskets, right? And he's really good, right? He can shoot from anywhere in the court, da, 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 da. He goes, now you take somebody who's got a ball in their hand and they're spinning it on this machine for eight hours a day for 30 years. Do you think they have some predictability? Do you think that they're going to make some baskets? I think they're going to have some like, oh, oh yeah, I know if I spin it about this pace and I start it right here at this number, we're going to get somewhere over there. You know, it's not as random as you think, basically, as this guy's take. And I hadn't thought about that because I'm, I think unlike some card games, I think that roulette is about the most random outcome that you could have. It feels like it. I mean, I always thought the house's advantage was just the green space, right? I mean, even with that advantage, they're going to come out way ahead. Yeah. Yeah. But this guy's take is, and it makes sense as you think about it. It does do make it sense. Every, every day for eight hours a day for 20 years or 30 years. And you know how fast you spin the thing and you know how fast you flick the ball around the opposite direction. It's right? the same. My, my game of choice as you know, is craps. When I, the few times I ever gamble, I enjoy playing craps. But I'll tell you, playing during the day with the four old men at the table who are all sober versus playing at night with a bunch of drunk people, <laughs> your results are way different. And it's specifically what you're talking about. The dude who's sober, who, who has thrown dice, clearly you can see this dude has thrown the dice a thousand yeah. times. Hundreds 5, of thousands times. of times. He's, yeah. he, he knows how to avoid that seven. Doesn't mean he's always going to do it, but he avoids right. it far more often than the woman that steps up to the table and goes, oh, let me throw. Or the dude who's <laughs> like, hey, hey, my friends, let me do it after my fourth, you know, whatever. And you're like, oh, my God, please take my money <laughs> off like, the no, table. No, 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 <laughs> yeah. Take it off, take it off, take it off. As fast as I can. Yeah, dude's shaking it with both hands, and the guy's got to tell him you can't use both hands to shake it. You're like, yeah, this is going to mm -hmm. go poorly. Yeah. But you're right. Uh, I hadn't thought about that. Hadn't thought I mean, about that at all. I, I don't know that they can pick a, pick a specific number, but I bet you they can get it in a range and they can look at the table and go, there's a lot of money on that bottom third. I'm going to put it over sure here. It lands. I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best to make sure it lands in this top th in these top two thirds. 
and I know I can get somewhere close if I do this. Do dealers get fired if people at their table or at their thing win too much? I don't know, but I know that uh, <laughs> it's like when you're playing blackjack and you win a bunch of hands in a row, and all of a sudden, like here's the new person. You're like, wait, didn't you just switch? Now I got the now I got that dude. I don't. I, I want the I want the one that I was winning. You know, yeah. it's supposedly random, right? I don't know. Supposedly, but then you see those. I'm going to show you. So for our back porch, I've got this really great thing. I want to. I want I, people can listen to it. Is that okay? Let's get there in just a second because we got a question okay. here from uh, while VJ. you're doing that. I'm going to look this up. And well, you got to listen to VJ's question because VJ's got a good one for us. Uh, okay. VJ said, "I better call Saul. See hi, N O G. If you've got a question for us, head to stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail. VJ, what do you got for us, man? Hi, Joe, OG, and neighbor Doug. I have a question about velocity banking. I saw a YouTube video where the creator was talking about using HELOC to pay off the mortgage. This may make sense if the HELOC rate is significantly lower than the mortgage, but the creator seemed to insist that it doesn't matter what the rates are. Am I missing something? When does it make sense to use velocity banking strategy? Thanks. See ya. Well, this one's easy. Never. <laughs> and that truly is is the answer. You know, I will say this. We talked about this earlier, our buddy Adam Carroll's product, which he calls the shred method that he mm -hmm. dives into where he uses debt and the time of the month and the amount, the, the key is what day you pay, how you take your money. And, and depending on the day the payments do and the day the interest hits, like you get really analytical about those dates and you pay them on the exact right day. It's been kind of impressive, but I also know OG that there's a lot of people on YouTube like VJ's talking about who are just going. Boo, 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 boo. What they're talking about is this. Let's say that you have a mortgage that has a $300,000 balance and you get paid $10,000 a month and you have the capacity to save 2000 a month. So your living expenses and everything is eight. You can invest two, but instead of investing two, you want to pay your house off with that too, right? So basically how this works is you go get a line of credit on your house. Let's say that line of credit is 100,000. So your mortgage is 200, I'm sorry, 300, and you got a line of credit for 100. You take the $100,000 line of credit and you pay off $100,000 of your mortgage. Okay, so now your mortgage is at 200,000. Now you're going to pay less interest there, but now you've got $100,000 debt on this side, so you're going to pay more interest there. But what you do with your paycheck, and this is what we were talking about on Monday, about like doing the opposite of this with your investment account. So now you take your paycheck and it goes in right into your HELOC. So that $10,000 that you make this month goes on your HELOC. Now really you're only paying interest on $90,000. Throughout the month, you know, you got to pay your bills, right? So that ninety dollars creeps up because you're going to make draws from it. So that draw, you draw, da, 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 and you finish the month at 98 because you had the capacity to save 2000. You only spent eight of your 10. Now you have a $98,000 debt instead of a hundred. But during the month, you only paid interest on 90 and then 91 and then 92 and so on and so forth as you used it. Follow? So in month two, you do the same thing again. So now you take your paycheck, which was $10,000. Now your HELOC is 88,000. So now you're only paying interest on the 88 as it ratchets back up toward the end of the month to 96 and then 86 and ratchets back up to 894 and so on and so forth. And just kind of wash, rinse, repeat. When that HELOC gets paid off, you do it again, another lump sum on the house. So now your house payment is down to maybe 150. You know what I mean? And so you just kind of do this along yeah. the way. So what are you doing? You're basically arbitraging the interest rate. You're trying to game out the time out when the interest is paid, like you said. You're saying, hey, I've got this line of credit. I can make this so that I'm I'm not paying, you know, as much interest, you know, I'm kind of changing the interest structure. But what's the big lever in all of that? Is the lever that? Is the lever the HELOC and all that sort of stuff? No, the lever is you're paying $2,000 a month extra on your house. That's the thing that's making the impact. So if you want to pay your house off quicker, just pay $2,000 a month on it. Refinance the house to a 15-year mortgage from a 30 you'll have an extra mortgage payment. <laughs> like it'll go up quite a bit. Guess what? You'll pay it off in 15 years instead of 30. Guess what? You'll save a crap load of interest by having a 15-year mortgage instead of 30. Get a 15-year mortgage and pay extra on it and pay it off in 10 years. Like there's all these ways to do that without having these multiple layers of complexity that undoubtedly in the right circumstances add a little bit of tactical value, right? Like I'm sure that 
there's some way mathematically to make this like I paid 800 less dollars of interest. Hell, it might even be I paid 8,000 less in interest by doing all these steps. Whatever. Yeah. But the bigger impact, the bigger lever in all of this is the fact that you've got two grand a month extra that you can put on your house. You doing it. And I would submit if you got two grand extra, why don't you just invest them? You know what I mean? Like some of that should go to your investment account. Some of it should go to your house pay. That's what we do. You know, I'm, I'm not an advocate of, I, I, I've never seen it work where I'm going to get the 30 year mortgage, but I'm going to invest the difference of the 15. And then in 15 years, I'm going to pay it off and I'll have extra, you know, that whole deal. I've never seen that play out in real life. I've also never seen anybody make their last mortgage payment, their 360th payment. Cause somewhere in the 10, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 balance range, you go, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> I just pay this damn thing off. I'm okay with lowering my cash reserve to pay, you know, so putting those two things together, what I've seen work really well because I'm doing it is a 15 year term with a little bit extra. That 15 year term with a little bit extra pays our house off in 10 years instead of 15. And yeah, everybody can do the math on that and be like, well, but if you would have invested that difference, but wait, in the last five there's years, a mathematical. Like yeah. Trust me, last five years as I've halfway through this plan of mine, I'm going, damn, I should have, maybe I should have taken the lower mortgage and, invested the difference. But I also know myself enough to know there's some chance that I got my fingers into that. This is a known outcome. I know that in seven years from now, my house will be paid off under seven, six, somewhere in there. And that's the worst case scenario. I know this also, VJ, works better for people with uh, high cash flow because, oh, gee, the higher your cash flow is, the more money you can leverage so that that $80 difference becomes 800, becomes 8,000, whatever it is. So if you've got high cash flow, it can work more which is the thing that I don't like about it. What I've seen and OG, what I think you've seen is that over time things change and this works really well until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, and you've got this big old HELOC loan that you didn't have before, and now you're running this method without the high cash flow you used to have. And now you're this train wreck with a bunch of dead instruments. Yeah, you're at the same spot you were. Yeah. And there's people, you know, that take this a step further and they use permanent life insurance, which totally wrecks it. Now you've got all this permanent life insurance tied up in your life strategy and your banking strategy. And if you're tying insurance into your banking, you're really messing up. Like, again, can it work? Yes. Does it work the way the people on TikTok say it works? Nope. It is much, much more difficult and uh, technical then they make it out to be, which the more technical it gets to your point, OG, the better chance you're going to screw it up. Like we just go back to behavior. I'm not a fan of all the finance talking head people, right? The Dave Ramsey's of the world and, you know, people like us and, you know, whatever, right? But when everyone says the same thing, generally speaking, trust me, if there was a way for permanent life insurance to make you wildly rich, I guarantee Dave Ramsey would tell you to do it. Because he's telling you to, to, to put money in, mutual funds at 12%. <laughs> you know, that's kind of horse patootie. You know what I mean? Robert Kiyosaki would be like, dude, don't buy apartment buildings, buy whole life insurance. You know what I mean? Like, what does he get out of sell- telling you to buy apartment buildings that he wouldn't get out of telling you to buy? Grant Cardone wouldn't be like, all right, screw the stock market, screw rental houses. Y'all need to get into whole life. You know, you'd hear that. That would be, and the fact that there's none of that, the fact that there's it's fringe, like the velocity banking thing, the bank on yourself stuff. All of this is like on the outskirts. Ought to tell you just enough to know like, all right, so if I do hear this, this has to be a one in a million case. Now, does Grant Cardone have a permanent life insurance policy? I, 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 honestly, I bet he does. He probably does, you know, for estate planning purposes. But it's a one, you know what I mean? It's like a one in a million he's reason. Not, he's not using to fund his next And property. he's certainly not using it to fund his retirement. Right. Yeah. yeah. He's he's solving an estate planning problem that's going to blow up in his lap, you know, when he dies. VJ, thanks for the question. Uh, if you've got a question, head to stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail and, uh, and a great one. I think something that a lot of people wonder about. By the way, if you're not wondering about velocity banking, you're like, you know what? I just need a strategy to get my debt together that dovetails with my investment strategy and how the heck I'm going to get to financial independence. OG and his team are taking clients. So head to stackybenjamins.com slash OG. That's the link to their calendar. And you can turn your life into an epic life of giggles and rainbows and unicorns. 
just because you met with OG and his team. Is that all the bridge all too that far? Happens. Is that, yes, no. stackofbenjamins.com slash OG. Last segment of the show we call the back porch. And it sounds like you came load. You've got a back porch. I got a back porch. You're going to talk about uh, investing. Uh, not investing. <laughs> That's so funny. Investing or Vegas. <laughs> One or the other. But you had a Vegas thing, OG. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Boom. I'm ready to hit it. Uh, you've listened to Tim Ferriss before, probably many sure. times. Yeah. Great interviewer. He's such a brand name that he gets to have a lot of a lot of people on there. He interviewed a guy, his name is Richard Turner, in person. So he does this interview in person. He also put this as a podcast on a show. But you don't need to watch it to be able to understand what's happening. So they are playing a card game. So it's Richard Turner, who is really good at cards, and Tim Ferriss. Okay? Good enough? Good enough. You ready to go, Joe? All right, here we go. This is some of that show. Available, we have some cards. Would you like to show anything? Show anything? Do anything? Oh, yeah. You have a deck of cards there for yourself, right? I do. Shuffle them up. All right, we'll see this how how amateur the shuffle can be here. Yeah, you just I can barely shuffle with two hands. Well, then use one. Yeah. I just showed you how. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, we're good to go. Switch decks with me. All right. Okay. There you go. Now, in poker, you've heard of like wild cards, like deuces are wild. Uh, baseball have multiple wild cards. Yes. Other games, so just cut a card. That would be the wild card. Just cut off half the deck. I'm going to move. There's one card left oh, over here. Oh, yeah, I can put, move. Please put it, put it on my deck. Yes. Yeah, all right. Keep, there we go. Okay. Just cut the deck in half here. All right. Tell me when you got it. Don't okay. Just to make it more random, just say any random number: three, four, five, seven, anything you want. Six. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. What's that card? Queen of Diamonds. So the Queens will be the wild card, okay? Now you just shuffle these cards, right? I did. Now, have you ever played poker for money? Yeah, and let me ask this. Have yeah. you ever played in a casino? Or have you ever wondered, when I, I play in a casino, I am have, I getting conned? I have lost in a casino. Okay, so that, <laughs> that thought has crossed your mind. Am I getting conned? <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm going to show you. You just handed me a randomized deck, and I'm going to do this in an interesting way. In the high stake games, they'll cut between every shuffle because that buries the top and bottom halves of the deck. I'll give the deck a little riffle, and they will, people like to cascade the cards into them. Give a cut. So I'm telling you what I'm doing as I do it, and I shuffle. Mm -hmm. Did everything look legit? Looked legit. And not a move you saw was. So you're already in trouble. Now I'll show you. I'll show you. <laughs> not a move I saw. Was, was honest. Not a one. Okay. Not a one. Now I'll show you how fast I could uncut that deck. What's that card? That is the two of clubs. The two of clubs. So they'll pass the deck to the right to be cut, and now the deck is no longer cut. The two still on top. <laughs> Watch again. Now watch again. I'm showing you how fast I can uncut the deck. The deck is no longer cut. Yeah. And that was about a half a second. Yeah. Now, you've heard of Texas Hold'em. I have, yeah. Okay, well, we'll deal a hand of Hold'em. And in Hold'em, they have what's called a cut card or a burnt card. They put a card in the deck on a face-up card. Now, after the fact, you're going to tell me how many people step up to my Hold'em table. Let's pick a number five or six because we don't have a lot of room. Uh, five. Five players. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Burn. And we always call the flop. What are those three cards? We got the king of hearts, the two of hearts, and the queen of clubs. And the deuces are not wild, but we did see the queens was your card. Mm -hmm. And so that means there's a pair of kings on the table. Where there's a burn and a turn. What's that card? That's king of burn turn. So right now we have three kings because the queen is a wild card. What's that card? That's a queen. Right now we have four kings. Let's get rid of our burnt card. And you're my partner sitting over here in hand number five. Let's see what you have in the pocket. What's that? That's a queen. What's that? That's a queen. So in the poker, you would have uh, five of a kind, five kings, or you'd have a, a royal flush, depending on how you wanted to play the hand. In other words, you killed them. Yeah. You slaughtered them, <laughs> beat them, whipped them big time. <laughs> okay. okay, so this goes on for like another six minutes. You can watch this. He figured out what was going on there, right? So he had a deck of cards. He shuffled it up. They oh, randomly I know the, picked a... I know the end of this story. There's a piece of the story that's even more amazing. Yeah, I'm going to get to that in a second. So you followed the whole thing, right? He was shuffling. He randomly drew a, a, a queen. He dealt out five hands of poker, you know, with the burn card and the whole deal, right? And, and his partner, who he decided, so Richard decided his partner was at the fourth position, flips over basically two queens, plus there being three queens on the board. Using a so deck that of, he didn't shuffle, but Tim shuffled. He didn't shuffle. Well, I mean, he shuffled it, yeah, but it was sure. given to him. He didn't, yes. you know, it wasn't full of kings or something. Right. And so he does all this. And then he does, you know, a few other things for another five or six minutes. 
And the most amazing thing out of all of this is what, Joe? The dude's blind. The dude's blind. He can't see any of the cards, and he knows exactly <laughs> what cards he's putting where. <laughs> so tell me that you have a freaking chance at a casino. That the roulette wheel dude or woman is not looking at that wheel and spinning or, that. Or the poker yeah. or the blackjack person who's shuffling the deck. This dude's blind and <laughs> drew his partner five of a kind. What's Randomly. That line from, what's that line oh from gosh. Rounders? If you don't know who the sucker at the table is. Yeah. That's you. What a great episode. Uh, by the way, you can catch all this on YouTube. It's called Impossible Card Tricks with Richard Turner and Tim Ferriss. It's fun to watch because you can see that he's blind in the video, right? And you can I listened actually, to this episode when it came out. I listened it's, to it, you know, when it came out, and then they dumped that on you in the last 10 minutes. Yeah. And uh, what don't people know about you? Oh, blind. And you're like, wait what? a second. <laughs> wait a freaking second. We'll link to it in the show notes. Remember, for your list of deeper dives, go get the 201, which will come out tomorrow. Man, we got a lot of good stuff on the 201. StackingBenjamins.com slash 201 to go over. We're going to go over everything from all the Vanguard stuff that we talked about, fees, fee structure, how much does that change things, what does set the bar, your asset allocation, how to do that. We'll uh, maybe talk a little bit about um, <laughs> a little bit about crypto. Probably we'll avoid the crypto stuff. I think people know that lesson. Okay, good idea. But Doug, you got the rest of it, man, from here. What should we have learned today? So what's on our to-do list based on what we learned today first? Take some advice from our headline. Love a company like Vanguard? Things change. Companies change. That's why financial planning is an ongoing sport and not a set it and forget it activity. Sure, you don't need to watch your stuff all day, but setting aside a couple of hours a year can help you make critical changes that save your bacon when Vanguard or any other company change course. Second, listening to crypto bros on TikTok? Well, I mean, seriously, do I even really need to finish that sentence? All right, yeah, I think everybody's got it. Yeah, all right, don't do it. But the big lesson? Joe's mom just took me aside, and turns out guacamole is, like, mostly avocado. So I just went and tried one, uh, and I, I kind of like them. I like green avocados. I like them on a bike. I like them on a hike. I like avocados all day. I like them way better than curds and whey. Hell, I don't even know what that is. I like them at noon. I like them with a spoon. Or, you know, or a fork. I'm not picky. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2024, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Joe gets help from a few of our neighborhood friends. You'll find out about our awesome team at stackingbenjamins.com, along with the show notes and how you can find us on YouTube and all the usual social media spots. Come say hello. Oh, yeah. And before I go, not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Mm -hmm.